Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd, the show where I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing Zero Escape, Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. In the last episode, we don't remember, we went ahead and made our way through the sixth door. We learned a lot more about Santa and maybe learned a bit more stuff about Ace. Very interesting stuff here. And in this episode, now that we've exited the sixth door, we are on our way to our next ending. So we're just going to see what kind of differences we uh, get to notice here. You'll remember in the previous timeline, or previous run-through, rather, after we uh, discovered the Nine Door, we went back, we talked to Seven and Lotus, and we uh, discovered that Clover was missing, and it seems like this timeline is going pretty much the same way. Hopefully this time around, things are a bit different, because if you'll remember last time, our search for Clover got cut short because, well, we kind of got stabbed right in the back like I've said before it was both metaphorically and literally and you know what maybe this time if things change a bit hey things have changed a bit because the dialogue won't skip Junpei and Jun ran to a large hospital room together as quickly as they could they searched around and under the beds and in the corners she's not here no she isn't all right just in case we should take a look in the shower room the shower room that's where her brother is. She might have gone to see him. Jun bit her lip. She knew, as Junpei did, that there was only one thing to see in the shower room, and it wasn't pleasant. Well, we might as well check, right? Let's go. There was a screwdriver stuck between the door and the frame. Junpei and Jun slipped through the door, moved down the hallway, and stepped onto the shower room. No luck. Yeah, I don't think she's here. June's voice was faint, and she placed her hands over her mouth. Her face looked like a little green. The stench in the room was almost unbearable. It had grown far more unpleasant since the last visit. If Junpei had eaten a lunch, he would have had difficulty retaining it. He wanted to leave the room as soon as possible, but he had to be sure. And the only way to be sure was to check the other side of the divider. Wait here. June offered no resistance and nodded weakly to Junpei as he headed around the divider. He stopped at the corner and turned his head. As he'd expected, Clover was nowhere to be seen. The only thing on the other side of the divider was a dead body, lying in a reddish-brown puddle of dry and drying blood. There are many ways a man can die, but this... The skull was shattered, and the head a little more than a plushy mass of brain, bone, and viscera. The left arm was hideously twisted in a horrific alien shape the bright white of the ulna shining through the remains of the skin and muscle. Huh? Wait. Bright white. Ulna. Bones. The pieces fell into place. Junpei remembered something Clover had told him in the laboratory. My brother's left arm is, um, it's not like a normal person's arm. The accident hurt him really bad. To save him, they... They had to cut off his arm. Of course. Of course! Why didn't he realize it earlier? Clover told Junpei that Snake's left arm was prosthetic. But the left arm of the corpse behind the divider was quite clearly a real human arm. Or at least it had been once. That meant... The, the, the corpse... Junpei and Jun headed back toward the large hospital room. They stepped through the door and out of the shower room. Down the hallway they went, searching for Clover in every corner. They had reached the stairs when... Seven appeared, breathless and yelling. Junpei! Jun! Where were you guys? He looked pale and his face was drawn. Something terrible had happened. Junpei's breath caught in his throat. Did... Did something happen? Seven drew a shaking hand across his face and gulped down a breath of air. Clover is... Clover's dead. I found her in the first glass bathroom. <sighs> 
All sound ceased for Junpei. The world was an empty, muffled expanse. Then he began to hear his own breathing. Jun's mouth moved, but he heard nothing. She tried once more, and her energy was gone, and she collapsed against the wall. He could have helped her, but he hadn't. And now, she was dead. So he stood there, frozen in place. Clover. Clover. Why? Why had this happened? He forced his body to move. Each step felt like another nail pounded into his heart. Finally, he was in front of her. He knelt and placed three fingers against Clover's neck. No pulse. No breath. But she was still warm, and her eyes were closed peacefully. It would have been easy to think she was asleep. Easy, that is, were it not for the slowly expanding puddle of blood beneath her. He traced its source back to her. A gash just beneath her shoulder blade. Was the weapon a knife, perhaps? If it was a knife, the killer had taken it when they left. When he closed his eyes, he cl saw Clover smile. Her innocent smile. Her energy. He would never see her smile again. He could have done something. He could have helped her. His stomach twisted itself into a sickening knot. Junpei lifted a limp Jun from the floor and carried her from the bathroom. Are you alright? It was a foolish question, and he knew it. Yes, I... I think so. Her voice was weak. The fever had gone down, but the emotional scars she received were not likely to recede as quickly. Junpei laid his hand on her shoulder, and they walked back to the bedroom. You should get some rest. He lowered June until she was sitting against the bed. She nodded once and stared at the floor. There were four others in the room. Ace, Lotus, Santa, and Seven. They all stared at nothing, their faces drawn and tired. After a while, they drifted into the bathroom to see Clover's corpse themselves. Once everyone was back in the bedroom, Junpei walked slowly to the center of it and looked around as the slumped figures gathered there. Who's the first to find the body? Me. Seven spoke from behind Junpei. He turned around. Seven's hand was up. Why'd you come to this room? To look for Clover. Why else? I found her body in the bathroom. As soon as I did, I ran outside. I got to the top of the stairs, by the casino, and yelled as loud as I could. Hey guys, I found her. It's bad. She's in the bathroom in the first class cabin. Come quick. Or something like that. Then I went back to the bathroom. Ace, Santa, and Lotus showed up real soon after that. But I guess you two hadn't heard me or something, cause you didn't show. So I took off down- so I took off down the stairs to look for you. After that, I mean, you know the rest, right? Junpei nodded and closed his eyes. And there was one more thing he needed to ask. Seven, there's one more thing I'm worried about. What's that? When we all finished the puzzles in this room, and the door- and got the door open, you stuck one of those plates in between the door and the frame, right? Why'd you do that? Come on, didn't I tell- didn't I already tell you that? I did that so the door wouldn't lock. So we could come back to this room. Oh. You think I did it? Well, I don't know. That kinda depends on what you say, doesn't it? Someone sighed and shook his head. Follow me. There were two doors standing next to one another. He opened the one on the right. Behind the door was a closet. Seven stepped inside. He stood in front of one of the shelves that filled it, and gestured toward a small box. The box was a small metal cube. He looked at Junpei. This is the reason. This safe. We couldn't open it when we were getting through this room. I figured there might be something pretty important in it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Besides, I figured eventually we might we might figure out what the numbers are for the safe. And if we did, I didn't want to screw around with the door 5 again. So I put that plate in the exit door so we could get back in that way. 
You get it now? Junpei nodded and looked at the safe. He grabbed the handle and shook it. Nothing happened. It was as locked as it had been when Seven found it. There was one change, however. Just underneath the safe was a pile of fine reddish-brown powder. Rust. Junpei stared at it for a moment. Had someone opened the safe, dislodging the rust? Junpei left the closet. Seven followed him back to the bedroom. It was cold and quiet. No one spoke. They sat, frozen in place by shock and grief and fatigue. The room felt tiny and oppressive, and the thick metallic smell of blood filled the room. Junpei turned and headed for the living room. Anything to get out of there. Was there some other clue, perhaps? Anything that might lead to him to whoever had stabbed Clover. He took his time and examined the room carefully. His eyes caught on the door. The door that led to the passageway of the door number five. Behind that door was the dead body of the ninth man. Maybe I should have another look at it, just in case. Quietly, he pushed open the door. The smell hit him like a blow to the face. His lungs contracted, unwilling to inhale such fetid air. Acid boiled up from the base of his stomach, churning what little food was there into a violent froth. It was too much for him, and he vomited. A thin stream of yellow water and bile spattered onto the floor. He wiped his mouth weakly and stared at the dead body. Chunks of torn flesh lay in an arc around the body. What remained of its intestines had slid out onto the floor. The pool of blood that framed it was half dry, but so thick that it had taken on a texture not unlike that of an egg yolk prepared sunny side up. On the floor next to the broken mass of the man's head lay his glasses, cracks spidering across the lenses. The blood stains near them had already dried like scabs on the floor. That was when he noticed. It's gone. His bracelet! It's gone! It had been there when Junpei had gone through door 5 before. He was sure of it. Right next to the glasses. But now... It was gone. The number 9 bracelet was gone. But why? Had someone taken it? He was turning it over and over in his mind when he heard Seven's voice. Huh? Where'd Junpei go? He had drifted out. It had drifted out to him from the living room. Junpei walked slowly out of the hallway. Oh, there you are. Were you looking for something in the hallway? Seven looked up at Junpei as Junpei entered the room. Did you find something? He thought for a moment before he responded. No, nothing. Technically, it wasn't a lie. He hadn't found anything. In a way, in fact, that was the problem. Something he'd expected to find hadn't been there. The ninth man's bracelet. What's up? Oh, well, I wanted you to take a look at something. What, what is it? Seven led Junpei back to the bathroom. As Clover's corpse came into view, he felt his heart flip and then fall to the bottom of his stomach. Something between a sigh and a groan escaped his lips. What was it that you wanted to show me? His voice was hollow and empty. I searched Clover's body again. I found this. As he spoke, he moved around Clover's head, then knelt down and flipped open her right hand. What? She was holding a piece of paper. I haven't actually looked at it yet. Didn't want to dis disturb the crime scene, you know. Basic stuff. Well, I did borrow one thing. He wasn't sure what that meant, but it likely didn't matter. The paper was more important. He picked it up and carefully opened it. There were two sentences written on it. Truth had gone, truth had gone, and truth had gone. Ah, now truth is asleep in the darkness of the sinister hand. What's this? Some kind of secret code? Seven peered over Junpei's shoulder at the note. Junpei stepped away from Clover's body and into the living room. He began to pace, attempting to decode the note. The first clue was likely the phrase, Sinister Hand. 
Sinister hand means the left hand. Sinister, sinister was a term used in heraldry that meant to the left of the bearer of a coat of arms. The left hand. The left hand. What does the left hand mean? Junpei looked at his own left arm. At the bracelet on his wrist. Did the darkness of the sinister hand have something to do with the bracelet? He examined the bracelet closely. There were two protrusions on either side of the face. The left and right sides of the face. Left and right. Left and right. Right and left. Truth is gone. Truth. Gone. It sounded funny. What did it mean? Truth. Gone. Maybe those two words... What else could they mean? What else could gone and truth mean? Truth, of course, meant something that was correct. Something that was fact. In other words, something that was right. It would follow, then, that gone meant left. After all, after someone left, they were gone. In this case, however, they clearly referred to their directional homonyms. So that means, truth equals right, gone equals left. That seemed to make sense. Junpei looked at the bracelet again, at the two protrusions on the left and right of the face. Junpei pressed them in the following order. Right, left, right, left, right, left. Right, left, right, left, right, left. And then... One after another, eight numbers flashed on then off of the face of Junpei's bracelet. He checked one more time just to be sure. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. One, four, three, eight, three, four, two, one. Huh? Hey, what are those numbers? Junpei didn't answer. He couldn't answer. He had no idea what they were either. Besides, he was sure he would forget the numbers and the order they came in if he said anything. 1438-3421. Muttering the numbers to himself over and over, Junpei headed toward the bedroom. 1438-3421. Before long, he found himself in front of the safe again. Its lock was the only device he could think of that required a sequence of numbers such as the ones he'd just discovered. Besides, someone had opened the safe at least once already. Did Clover come to the bedroom to open it? 1438-3421. Jinpei slowly dialed in the numbers that the bracelet had given him. One to the right. Four to the left. Three to the right. Eight to the left. Three to the right. Four to the left. Two to the right, one to the left. Finished. Junpei heard the small, telltale sound of the lock opening. He grabbed the handle, took a deep breath, and pulled it up. Inside was a piece of paper. It was roughly the same size as the one Clover had been holding. Junpei picked it up. This is what it said. Fact number one. The Nonary game was played once before, nine years ago. Fact number two. The person with the number two bracelet attended the game nine years ago. Fact number three. It was planned by the following four people. Cradle Pharmaceutical CEO, Gentaro Hongo. Cradle Pharmaceutical Chief of Staff, Nagisa Nijisaki. Cradle Pharmaceutical R&D Supervisor, Teruaki Kubota. Majority Shareholder in Cradle Pharmaceutical, Kage... Kagechika Musashido. I must punish them for the innocent lives they sacrificed. This is the only warning they will receive. That innocent souls might be saved, I now state the truth. Zero. Junpei left the closet. There were five people waiting for him in the bedroom. Ace, Lotus, Santa, Seven, and June. He looked at each one of them in turn, then slowly placed his hands in the pockets of his vest. Sorry, but do you think you could all come with me? And come with you? I want all of you to go to the big hospital room. Why? 
but there's something I want to be sure of. What do you want to be sure of? I want to know if the person I suspect is really the culprit. We then you're saying... Yeah. I think I've got it figured out. I know who killed Snake and Clover. And we are going to discover who killed Snake and Clover in the next episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!